Coral reefs are a natural phenomenon arousing interest in researchers not only because they occupy an area in the world ocean 20 times greater than the territory of Europe, but also because reef building creates enormous organogenic masses. While recent reefs are of prime importance to marine resources, transport and construction, reefs formed in the geological past are of particular interest to prospectors, as they are sometimes natural reservoirs of crude oil. In Bulgaria, coral reefs have been found in sedimentation strata formed during the Cretaceous, Paleogene and Neogene periods. But today there are no reefs in the Black Sea. In the absence of a local live natural model of reef formation, Bulgarian researchers oriented themselves towards waters with an abundance of corals and reef building. While reefs in the Pacific and Indian Oceans have been investigated by numerous scientific experts, fewer studies have been made in the Atlantic. These considerations are that ancient corals of the Cretaceous and Neogene period have been established on the territory of Cuba, suggested investigations of the Cuban archipelago together with a group of Cuban colleagues. There were only scanty data about fossil and recent Cuban corals and were collected mostly from the skeletons of dead corals washed ashore by the waves or by occasional dredging. Using scuba gear, we investigated their natural habitat. A systematic study was made of the Cuban shelf from the shore to the deep four reef slope at a depth of 50 meters, occasionally to 70 meters and maximal depth for direct observations up to 90 meters. We thus studied 66 underwater profiles from 194 underwater stations. We collected more than 6,000 specimens and the most typical ones were photographed in situ before their removal from the bottom. This material and our observations have revised the taxonomy of the Caribbean corals, while the ecological investigations broke new ground. The results of our expedition will be published in a color album with underwater photography of present-day Cuban species and in a monograph on the fossil and recent coral fauna in Cuba. Our camera shows the established types of reefs, their ecological zonation and provincialism. We found the established fringing and barrier types of reefs and a special type in the Bay of Guanacayabo. The assumption that there were atolls was not justified. These 20 to 25 meter high reefs are really unique as they have been built on mud by species which as a rule are not found in reefs. The geological environment and hydrodynamic regimen of the bay, muddy bottom and cloudy and almost stagnant waters are quite unusual in recent reefs. This exceptional phenomenon has aroused interest in paleontologists and lithologists as they have often found fossil reefs formed over clay. Why and how has this occurred? The weak light of the stagnant and muddy waters makes them inaccessible both to the cameraman and to the rich tropical bentos. 
With an underwater visibility of only 20 to 30 centimeters, we found their foundations and vertical walls to be built of representatives of the Ocolina genus, also known as ivory coral and the bushy cladocora. Their light and strongly branching colonies were able to develop on the soft bottom. The lack of competition and the available large and uninhabited bottom areas helped them form mass settlements and together with sponges to construct these paradoxical reefs. Fringing reefs have been formed wherever the shelf is narrow. Such reefs proved not to be inhabited by the same species along their entire length. This is due to the complicated ecological environment. The strong breaking seas prevent the growth of corals on the steep shore. It is only at the base of the rock that colonies of Agerizia, Diploria and Siderastrea corals have been able to gain a secure foothold. Offshore, at a depth of 2 to 4 meters, appear representatives of the Acropora palmata species. At first, they are low, flat, and strongly fixed to the bottom. Then they gradually grow taller and branch out on more than one plane. Here, the destructive force of the waves is not felt, and we found underneath tender colonies of Agaritia. shore is not a vertical rock but a gently sloping sandy beach there is less abrasion and acropora thrive right next to the shoreline shallows are often covered with a soft zoanthus coral shores at a depth of 10 to 15 meters Acropora cervicornis form attractive and dense stands. Among them channels running perpendicularly to the shore facilitate circulation of the bottom waters. On this account these channels are inhabited by other species with a stable spheric colony such as Heliastrea, Colpophilia, Diploria, Mycetophilia. Towards the rounded sides of the deep four reef slopes, we find more frequent lamella agaritia colonies. In this part, the fringing reef is similar to the barrier reef and will be discussed later. On the poorly lighted walls of overhangs and hollows, in caves or under rock blocks close to the shore, at insignificant depth one finds species alien to the bustling and well-lighted parts of the reef. Some of them have been known only as the result of dredging in the waters of Central America at a depth of several hundred meters. The establishment of this fact has expanded their normally accepted bathymetric range. Why have they settled here? Is it because they like a darker environment or have they moved in because they have found free ecological niches inaccessible to the photophile species?
very small solitary corals were found on the lower surface of certain coral colonies. The question was whether these were adults of independent species or young specimens of familiar species underdeveloped because of certain adverse conditions. Recently, interesting investigations were made in Jamaica regarding the ethology of coral associations. The order of aggressiveness was investigated, meaning the sequence in which certain corals oust others by destroying neighboring polyps. Certain authors call this aggressiveness also a species characteristic. It is true that there are real ethological relationships between different systematic units, but they should not be postulated as attributes of a specific taxonomic order. The rich Cuban material contains series of cohabitating corals showing a transition between species described as independent. Some specimens in their various parts bore marks of more than one species. Here is a typical representative of Mitsitophilia Lamarckiana, of the new Mitsitophilia alice, and of the new Mitsitophilia ferox. In this specimen, on one half the corallum bears the mark of Mitsitophilia Lamarckiana, and on the other part of alice. Here we see marks of Lamarckiana and of Ferox. Thus the new species prove to be forms and their ethological relationships, relationships of infra subspecies categories. Barrier reefs are formed on a comparatively broad shelf when the deep fore reef slope is considerably offshore. The barrier itself grows near the end of the shelf. We have such reefs before the archipelagos Los Colorados, Savannah Camagüey, Jardines de la Reina, and Los Canareos. In such types of reefs, we observe a much clearer ecological zonation of the coral associations due to the barrier itself, which creates a great difference in the ecological environment in the landwater, top and seaward sides. In such case, the coral ecologic zones correspond to the separate elements of the morphology of the underwater relief. Deep four reef slope, four reef slope, breaker, flat, rear, and lagoon. The deep four reef slope creates a very asymmetric ecological environment, as the escarpment on which the corals grow is very steep, in places vertical, and the rays of the sun glance off. This explains the flat colonies fixed sideways at one end to the rock, perpendicularly to the rays of light. The lack of active movement of the waters explains the brittle colonies and the less available food in depth, the necessity of more feeding ground and the greater dispersion of individuals in the colonies. The optimal growth of colonies on thin plains takes place through intramural budding. These are typical traits of the Agaritia species, which cover the deep four reef slope. The zone has been named after the genus. A diver going down beyond the 50 or 60 meter mark of the vertical deep four reef slope enjoys the challenge of physiological endurance and the thrill of probing the realm of the unknown. Agaritia of this color, found at a depth of 82 meters, shows the capacity of corals to beam light of this color, as the red color of the sun rays is completely absorbed at such depth. This Heliastrea cavernosa, commonly found in shallows, has been collected from a depth of 70 meters, bored by a cleona sponge, under which a cariophilia has found shelter.
uniformity of the bottom and the resulting monotony of the associations of seabed fauna does not apply to other fauna in the upper part of the deep fall reef slope because here we have migrants both from the shallows and from the depths of the seas. The deep fall reef slope is always an emotional site and the decompression period gives divers a chance of assimilating their thrilling experience. More sharply express the transition from the deep fall reef slope to a fall reef the clearer the change in the coral population. This is due to the huge impact of the mass of water on the fall reef slope, where the bottom slopes gently is well lighted with abundant food in the middle. On this account, the colonies are securely attached, strong and usually spherical. Their diameter is often 50 centimeters and sometimes reaches two or three meters. Corals usually inhabit the bottom when it is rocky. On sandy bottoms, colonists cluster around the first settler who gains a foothold and thus form oases in the sandy desert known as cabezos. The active movement of food-rich waters favors the development of eight-point Gorgonacea corals whose supple bodies meet the movement with their flat sides and give the fall reef landscape impressive plasticity. This is the optimal zone for filtrating fauna and abounds in sponges. They often englobe the coral colonies and destroy polyps. The waters of the Caribbean do not have acanthaster fish, which must destroy corals in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Here sponges play a similar aggressive role but are less destructive. In certain cases, the boring sponges cause smooth and weak damage to the surface of the colony. This changes the morphological picture of the skeleton and we seem to be in the presence of a different species. This pathological but not taxonomic phenomenon is enhanced by ecological factors relating to the aggressor and not to the coral, as proved by the fact that the damage to colonies is greater in zones favoring sponge growth. In other cases, the cleona sponges bore into the colonies and create a dense canal network. When growing near sponges, tubastrea colonies are considerably smaller in size than when growing unmolested. Coral sponge relationships are not always antagonistic. They are of mutual benefit when certain species of sponges overgrow the lower surfaces of coral colonies and the edges of the colonies form undulating folds. In such case, sponges have a lot of room without rivals, while the corals find food in the strong current caused by the sponges and have their lower surfaces protected by the aggressive pleona. Two coral zones were established within the reach of the four slope. The lower is extremely rich in various species, Cifastrea, Heliastrea, Agaritia, and Diploria. It is hard to tell which species predominates. The front reef over the Overkang is inhabited mostly by Milipalcicus, a species of hydrozoa which has given the zone its name. The breaker of the barrier reef meets the force of the surf and even in the calmest weather there is a white foamy stripe. We have to wait long for a perfect calm this zone. In the early morning hours the fish drowse in the still waters 
but when the raging waters come, which streak out of sight. The hydrozoic colonies of Millepora complata, thin vertical platelets solidly bound together in multi-angular incrustations on the rocky bottom, are the fauna able by vibration to withstand the shock of the constant surf. The complanata zone is only three to four meters wide. cannot always be easily studied. After the powerful frontal sweep, the following mass strikes the crest of the reef. Here the depth is up to 40 or 50 centimeters, and the zone is from 30 or 40 to 100 meters wide. Enormous tree-like sound colonies of Acropora palmata, giving their name to the zone, sometimes form dense stands which can be crossed in a calm only by a very experienced diver. The foot of large palmata is often densely inhabited by the soft zoanthus corals. There are also isolated coppices with the finger-like porites coral. We also find the prickly isophyllid corals. The reef barrier is in certain places intersected by natural canals. Along them flow the compensating masses of local and tide waters. Their bottom is rutted, rarely sandy, and more often gravely, with broken up and partially destroyed large coral colonies. The canals can be approached and investigated only in the short period between high and low tide. Here is the columnar Dendrogyra cylindrus coral, whose polyps fan out day and night, if not disturbed by some foreign body. In a rising sea or ebb tide, the diver risks to be swept by the waters away from the canal and to be forced to wait for a change of direction or a rescue vessel. The Acropora cervicornis zone inhabits the rear of the reef. This narrow strip, with an average width of 5 to 20 meters, is the best protected from the surf. That is why the delicate bushy colonies of this type flourish here. Divers swimming along the length of the zone enjoy the view of the exquisite branching colonies traversed by schools of multicolored swimmers. Isophilia and Ageritia are common in this zone. In the lagoon, we usually have the settlement of particles thrown over the barrier or chipped off the flat of the reef. The toppled colonies of Acropora palmata make us think of a fierce tornado with a gentle lady's name. Some of the shattered colonies are able to regenerate themselves and continue to grow standing on their heads. The mingling of the colder ocean waters with the warmer waters of the sheltered lagoon cause oolitic accumulations. The Cuban Shelf is a rare example of oolitic formations in recent waters. This frequent process in the geological past led to the accumulation of valuable mineral deposits. That is why the seabed is often sandy, formed by rock abrasion or oolitic. The absence of a firm substratum makes it difficult for the free-swimming planula to attach itself. But if it finds some hard object, the Meandrina meandritis coral founds a colony around which others start growing. 
The need of solid foundations is the cause of frequent incrustations. These may take place on a gorgonia, a iron bar, a gastropod, a bottle, and in rare cases on mangrove roots. The rose coal, Manitinario lapa, on the sandy and muddy bed of the lagoon, has given the zone its name. Here the representatives of this species are dwarfish because their growth is arrested when they reach a certain critical weight at which the corallums start sinking into the soft seabed. On a rocky bed, the same species grows to a much larger size. Consequently, the soft substratum determines the dwarfish character of certain Manitinariolata. These observations and the application of the principle of actualism explain why small corallums of only one species are found in lower Cretaceous clays in northern Bulgaria. In the lagoon, we also found Heliastrea, Cifastrea, Diploria and other corals. Wide lagoons have internal currents which cause sedimentation. In such case, the seabed is like a sandy desert. Near inhabited localities, the lagoon water is soiled and strongly inhibits coral life. Only two or three genera, or only the Siderastrea, survive. The urbanization of the shallow offshore waters leads to paradoxes in coral life. For instance, off Havana, at a depth of 12 to 15 meters, corals are almost entirely absent, but at a depth of 35 to 55 meters, they thrive. There are also large fields of Thalassia grass, which are the habitat of the Oreaster reticularis starfish. sand carried into the lagoon may accumulate on the beach and form exotic beaches and beach rock. Slow positive longshore movements at certain moments of geological history eroded flourishing reefs and parts of colonies formed the Seburuco formations terraces. They are typical of the Cuban coast. Atmospheric agents have roughened the terraced surface into so-called canines. The problem now arises whether the ecological zonation established here exists in other recent reefs. No comparison with neighboring aquatory is possible for the moment because these last have not been investigated by the same mythology and scale. The available data regarding the Bahama Bank, Florida, the Mexican coast, and the rest of the Antilles show a certain similarity with the species predominating in the various parts of the reef. This warrants their classification into a Caribbean province. In the equatorial part of the Atlantic, where climatic conditions would lead one to expect intensive reef building, there are no reefs. This is due to the fact that the large Orinoco and Amazon rivers carry into the ocean enormous quantities of freshwater silt. South of the estuaries, reef building is observed as far as Rio de Janeiro, where it is restricted by a thermal barrier. The ecological zonation along the South American coast differs from that of the Caribbean. For instance, the four reef slope is built of representatives of the Musismilia genus, which is unknown in the Antilles. Thus, we can categorize the South American reef building or hermitide corals into a Brazilian province. While the characteristic shallow water coral populations of every province differ distinctly, 
at greater depth, this difference tends to gradually disappear. This shows that the action of the two rivers as an insulation barrier takes effect only in the surface water layers. The equatorial current reaching the eastern coast of South America prevents the migration of planula towards the south and thus protects this endemism. The presence of hermatite corals around the Bermudas at a latitude of 32 degrees north is explained by the warm influence of the Gulf Stream. There are many question marks regarding the population of reef building corals in the equatoria of West Africa. Here there are no reef formations but only isolated colonies close to the islands. This is explained by adverse influence of the West African rivers and the presence of colder waters. The species composition is similar to that of the Caribbean but is considerably poorer. That is why we should list a separate West African province. In these areas, sediment of the new gene and quaternary periods do not contain reefs, while in Cuba corals flourished back in the Cretaceous period. Observations of the present ocean current suggest a possible migration only from east to west, but recent investigations of larvae of Bentus representatives have proved the possibility of an inverse migration from the American towards the African shore. Paleontological data have been found tracing migrations in this direction, proving the West African corals to be of Caribbean origin. And so in the Atlantic we have three separate provinces, the Caribbean, the Brazilian and the West African, while the Bermudas occupy a special place. Panama Isthmus is a typical geographical barrier separating the three provinces in the west forming the Caribbean region. Today the two sides of Panama are inhabited by different coral populations. Each of them has its own ecological zonation and for every association of each ecological niche in one region there is an ecological analog in the other region. The limited aerial in the Caribbean region certain adverse hydrographic conditions and the frequent interruptions of reeling in the course of the geological development explain the poorer quantitative and species coral life compared with the other global hermatype region, that of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. While the reef building corals clearly show endemic regions and provinces, their deep sea brothers their hermitide corals are cosmopolitan. The monotony and relatively unchanging ecological parameters in the deep waters have not stimulated their evolution. In the geological past, the ocean depths probably gave shelter to certain settlers which have preserved their archaic traits to the present day. Our meeting with the Cuban corals is nearing its end. Their astonishing plasticity, coloring, tender grace and sturdy resilience show that these qualities of the coral colonies are not accidental, but the function of their environment. The elucidation of these conditions will prevent future erroneous interpretation of similar phenomena in fossil reefs. The frequent observation of profuse reef building corals down to a depth of 65 meters considerably lowers the lower line where they thrive than the conventionally accepted depth of 35 to 40 meters. The upper line of Ahermite species observed in the depths of the ocean should be raised as a result of their observation in the longshore shallows. Observations on the striking variability within a single colony or in colonies of one and the same population should prevent paleontologists from the erroneous description of more species than actually exist because of inadequate material or by neglect of the variability phenomenon.
But even these investigations do not cover the whole field. It is normal that interest in certain aspects of a problem should arouse interest in new, more extensive and more interesting fields of research. The silent world, the cradle of life, jealously keeps its secrets.